Hey everyone, it's Nsala here and welcome back to my channel for a brand new video. I hope you're all doing okay, I'm too. I want to start by thanking everyone that has subscribed to my channel this far and I always see the numbers increase or just anyone who views my video or likes it or comments, it means so much to me. So thank you very much. And yeah, so today's case, we're going to be talking about the Florin family or let's say couple rather. And this case took place in the late 90s from, let's say, 1998 to 1999. So, yeah, the very late 90s. And so let's begin with our case. There was a couple that lived in Swakopmund and they were the Florin couple. This was the husband named Thomas Florin who was 32 years old at the time. And he lived in Swakopmund, which is the coastal part of Namibia. He lived there with his wife. Monica Florin and together they had two children who were aged two and four years old at the time And now they lived in Swakopmund and they seemed happy It was you know the coastal part good weather Beautiful environment and they seemed like a happy couple to everybody who saw them or knew them and really didn't know what was happening within the marriage however, they had a really serious problem and that was a financial problem that was because the husband, Thomas Florin, could not keep a job. He was considered a jack of all trades, master of none. That means he would jump from job to job, business to business, from different ideas. He would do this and that, a bit of everything, but was never really stable and could never really bring home a, you know, a constant or stable income that would support the family. And for instance, when he started, he was initially a firefighter didn't last long in that job and then moved on to become a carpenter and as he was doing carpentry he didn't last long there too and then he was unemployed for some time it's like he would leave a job and not have a next plan he would just leave because he wanted to leave he didn't want to do it anymore and not consider the family or how he would provide for them so he remained unemployed for quite some time and his wife monica would get frustrated and infuriated with her husband's behavior or lack of responsibility she would force him to get a job you know try to encourage him but then get frustrated and yell at him and he got another job and this time he was a chef and I'm sure you won't be surprised by this but like the other jobs he did not last long there as well he also left that job and I'm actually quite surprised that he was always able to get all these different type of jobs. I mean, carpentry, chef, and then like, these are firefighters, these are completely different sectors. How he was always able to get into is actually quite amazing. But when he left that job, this is where he became a complete problem because then he was just full time at home. Didn't care about the family, the financial responsibilities fell completely on his wife Monica. She took care of everything. Plus, being the primary caregiver of two toddlers was even worse for her. So, she was really frustrated and infuriated with her husband. And over time, because she became sort of the man in the house, the breadwinner, didn't have any support, she started losing love for her husband because she didn't feel like she had a husband anymore. She felt like she had a third kid now. And the romance died and affection died within the marriage. However, when all this was happening, Thomas still remained hopeful he thought that it was just a rough patch they were going through and they would fix things while not trying to fix himself because he knew what was frustrating his wife but didn't put effort to change himself or these bad characters that he had you know to fix the problem he just remained hopeful that ah, one day i guess she'll get tired and you know get over it but now the problem was they even stopped sharing a bedroom they started sleeping in completely different beds in different bedrooms and like I said, the romance had died. That's when as time went on, because now Monica had completely detached herself from the marriage. It's like they were living together as roommates who had kids together, but they were not a married couple anymore. But the marriage certificate was still there, you know, and she started seeing other men. And it was nothing serious, so just be casual dates here and there, probably see them once, you know, just people should talk to. And in January of 1998, she met a man named Olaf, I don't know how to pronounce this surname, I think it's Gudenhas. So Olaf Gudenhas became a very good friend of her. They began, they developed a relationship, but it was a non-sexual relationship because she was still married and respected that. 
they would just talk to each other it was somebody that she could confide in and they would take long romantic walks on the beach with monica's dog and you know do the little couple things but it was never moving forward into something more serious and that's how it remained for some time however when Monica's husband Thomas found out that his wife had made a male friend or what he thought was having an affair with another person, he became very jealous and very angry. He went as far as going to Olaf's job when he was working and confronted him in a very jealous and, you know, angry tone and he just warned him to stay away from his wife to stay away from his marriage, to not ruin things for him and to just, you know, back off and, you know, because she's a married woman, what are you doing with a married woman? And after this happened, Olaf, because of the way he was confronted in such an aggressive tone and manner, became very worried and talked to Monica about it, told her everything that had happened at his job and suggested that they stop everything and they don't continue with this relationship and just pause everything until she's able to figure out what she actually wants to do if does get a divorce then she had to do it or if she wanted to stay within the marriage she just continue but he wasn't really interested in continuing anything with her and she rather advised him to not pay him any mind to ignore everything he says because she was over the marriage it was a broken marriage they didn't even share the same bed anymore they didn't do anything together as a couple so she didn't want him to be worried about him and when she said all these things Olaf calmed down a bit and they just continued with their friendship now in the same 1998 Thomas Florence Namibian residence permit was withdrawn so he had a limited number of days let's say before he had to leave the country permanently and this meant that he would either have to move to another country but he opted to return to where he came from which was germany and he decided to move there but before he left he told his wife or rather suggested that they all move as a family that's monica and the two children and thomas move back to germany and start life afresh there However, Monica was long detached from this marriage, so this was an absolute no for her because she didn't love her husband anymore, she didn't want to be in the marriage anymore, she, she didn't even understand why she still lived in the same house as him because there's nothing that she wanted from him or, you know, she just wanted out of the marriage. So moving to Germany with someone that she didn't love or care about anymore was an absolute no for her, so she refused when she heard that suggestion. And this actually really upset Thomas because now he was starting to really see that the marriage was going downhill and it was almost to its end. But he was trying and he was still hopeful that it would work and he suggested and suggested but she just refused. And that's when he then a couple of days later went to Venduk which is a few kilometers away and he went there to go buy the plane tickets it's like he had already concluded that everyone is leaving and we are all going and when he did that he came back to Sokobund and they had a fried container so in this container he began moving all the properties and everything in the household basically he had decided they're leaving so now I wonder, as he was moving all these things, the furniture, basically packing up the entire household, what Monica was doing because it didn't seem like she did anything about it. I bet in her mind she was just thinking, you know, let him take whatever he thinks is his and he'll go and leave me and never come back. And now, while this was happening, he was doing this thinking that she would eventually come to her senses and she would decide to move with him and then they would leave. But on the contrary, that was not what happened. And he asked her again if she would go with him and she refused. That's when he came up with another proposal that rather he take the two children with him to Germany and then she could remain. Which was an absolute no because these were her babies. I mean they were toddlers and they needed their mom and she was the primary caregiver. They were used to their mom more than they were their dad. So that was a complete no for her. And this is where he became really, really angry and felt like he was, you know, she was trying to keep his kids away from him and he was not happy about that. 
But as time went on, and now this was the beginning of June, some days went on, and the neighbors realized that they stopped seeing Monica. They knew that she was the type of woman who wake up in the morning, do her garden, and you know, wave to the neighbors, good morning, and all that, but they hadn't seen her. So when they didn't see her for some days, they then approached her husband Thomas and asked like, oh, where is your wife, you know, to know about her whereabouts. And he told anybody and everybody that asked about Monica's whereabouts that she was in Cape Town visiting her relatives there. But people didn't really believe it and they really didn't have a reason not to believe him. They were just suspicious, but because they had no reason to doubt him, they just accepted that explanation. And now that the house was completely packed up, everything in the house was now in the containers, Thomas took their two children and left Swakopmund and was heading to Van Duke. And she had a, uh, Monica the wife had a really close friend who was Petra. And Petra Moltan was her really close friend who she confided in all the time. And when she didn't hear from her friend, she decided to go look for her together with her boyfriend, Sieg Siegfried. So Siegfried and Petra went together to the house because now they knew that Thomas had moved out and the house was now empty. They entered the front door and they walked around and the first thing that they noticed was a really large big pot on the stove. And one thing they really remember about this pot is that it was badly burnt. Like whoever had been using it had been cooking for years. It was really really charred. And they moved further into the house. Nothing was strange. It was an empty house, no furniture and nothing. But as they went further and looked in different rooms, they found a plastic bag. And when they opened the plastic bag, they found a human skull. And now they panicked and they didn't know what to do. They immediately alerted the police to what they had discovered. And the police immediately acted on this and came to the residence. And now the problem with this is that they had nobody to ask as to what is a human skull doing in the house and since Monica was nowhere to be found they then decided to look for her husband Thomas and like I said Thomas was already on his way now to Ventuk which is the capital of Namibia and while in Ventuk they were actually so lucky the police to find him and they found him just in the nick of time because they arrested him while he was on his way to the airport about to catch a flight to Germany with his two children. And once they finally arrested him, they took him to the police station for interrogation. And when the police asked him the same questions the neighbors had been asking him, where is Monica, your wife? He would respond with the same thing, that she was in Cape Town visiting her relatives. But the police didn't believe this because they heard from people who knew her that she was not the type to just leave her kids like that to go visit relatives. She would rather take her children with with her rather than leave them with Thomas and now the police got whiff of the fact that Thomas had a fried container which had all his belongings and they then decided to go and search the container to see if they could find any proof or any evidence as to maybe where Monica could be if she was maybe there or if she indeed was in Cape Town they just wanted to make sure that the container was you know okay and when they searched the container, everything was okay except for the fact that he was in possession of wildlife products which was illegal for the mere fact that he didn't have the permit to obtain these wildlife and the permit to export these wildlife so to take them to Germany like he had planned to. So those were already two crimes he had committed. And now the police were happy because they had no concrete evidence to keep him in the station, so they were forced to have to release him. But the fact that he had this wildlife illegally, he they had now had a reason to keep him in custody. So they were really pleased by that and that would have given them more time to figure out what's happening and to do an investigation. And then they charged him for the illegal possession of wildlife products and he was in police custody. And that's when the police then went to back to their residence, which was in Brookhan Street, and there they decided to search the house and just look for any tips or any details, but the house was spotless. The house was clean, there was no furniture, it was an empty home, and there wasn't really much searching they could do, or 
that's when they searched every place in the house and they could get a foul smell but they didn't know where the smell was coming from and it wasn't really that foul but it was a smell that as they continued progressing within the house it got stronger and stronger and stronger but when they looked around all rooms are empty there is no place where they could figure out the smell was coming from they looked everywhere until they looked in the last place and this was the ceilings of the house and in the ceilings that's when they found some really disturbing and horrific things so in the ceilings they found a red plastic basin and in that basin they found remains which looked cooked and they didn't really know what it was because they were all you know dismembered they had been cut up into pieces so they probably thought it was some animal or like cow or goat, you know, beef meat and they were not sure about it until they removed the basin and in another one they also found a hammer or a hammer, I don't know how you pronounce it but yeah, they found a hammer in there as well and when they got closer and closer and investigated more in the basin they then realized that these were human remains that had been cooked and they then were so surprised because they didn't get what they were doing up there in the ceilings and they then took this information during their interrogation with Thomas and asked him about those remains as to who they belong to and who's the victim, who's the person. But he kept quiet and didn't say anything. He knew nothing about it. But when they did DNA testing, they were able to positively determine that these were the remains of Monica Florin the 30 year old mother of two and everybody was so surprised by this and they were so shocked about this but the only person who had access to this or who could have done this because they still looked quite fresh was Thomas Florin and he had just been in the house a few days before so then they took this case to trial and he was charged with the murder of his wife Monica Florin during the trial because Thomas never admitted to doing this, they, the prosecution had to come up with a scenario or sort of a timeline to explain as to what could have happened or who did this or who did that. And so I'm going to now tell you the timeline or the scenario which they believe according to the evidence they found and different information that they had as to what happened. So the last day that Monica was ever seen, was the 2nd of June in 1998. So they believe that on the 2nd of June or on the 3rd of June, after Thomas asked his wife if he could take the children with him to Germany and she refused, he was very angry and was so upset because he felt like she was trying to take his children away from him. That's when she went to bed that evening and while she was in bed, Thomas hit her on the head with a blunt object. This is this is to believed to be the hammer which was found in the ceiling. That blunt object was the hammer. And after that, he dragged her body into their bathroom, placed her body in the bathtub and began to carve her body. He dismembered her body, cutting it into many different pieces. And after he was done with that, it wasn't enough because he then removed the flesh from the bones and then some of the internal organs and some of the flesh he dumped in the ocean some of the flesh was then pushed down the drainage system of the house and the remaining flesh that was there he boiled it in that really big pot which Petra found when she came to search for her friend that they found really burnt on the stove and the rest of the remains, the bones, he then put them in the oven and cooked them that way. And he basically did all this. It was to stop the decomposition process so that he would buy enough time to run away or to elope with his kids while the remains would be in the ceiling and this would slow down so that there wouldn't be a smell or, you know, a foul smell when people come into the house and he would have enough time to you know leave the country and this was really surprising in the process that he did it because of just the sheer like heartlessness of it all to do this to the mother of his children is what really surprised the people because if it was about custody of the kids there are legal processes that could have been done to 
get custody of his kids if he felt he was the best parent but instead to uh, completely eliminate his wife was just so heartless and during the trial Monica's friend that was Petra Moulton and her boyfriend Siegfried were one of the state witnesses and when they were being cross-checked by the defense attorney they were asked questions which tried to imply as though they were the ones responsible for Monica's death because one of the defense that Thomas had was the fact that his wife was having an affair so he tried to defend himself by claiming that probably one of her lovers was responsible for her death and when they were asking Petra and Siegfried about what happened and how they found her, the defense then claimed that probably Siegfried had been one of Monica's many lovers and Monica then threatened to tell her friend Petra that they had been having a relationship because Petra and Siegfried were a couple and then he decided to kill her and you know do all this to her so it would be then put on her husband Thomas instead of lead, leading to him and the second theory which they had was the fact that Petra found out about this relationship this affair and then killed her own friend and when she panicked she then called her boyfriend to come and help her and together they cooked the body and they hid it in the ceiling but this was completely disproved in fact the couple was actually astonished when they heard this and could not believe that they were being accused of this and they vigorously denied all the allegations and as it went on in trial Petra also revealed everything such as Monica's complaints to her about her husband and how she had lost love for her she did admit that she had been seeing other men and was talking to Olaf but it was nothing sexual she revealed all this uh, during the trial and it was really really surprising to people that Thomas looked had such, such a nonchalant attitude and he kept claiming that he was innocent you know so now during the trial Christine Hressman who was a neighbor of the Florin family she also lived on Brooken Street in Swakopmund with the couple she noticed a couple of things and she came as a witness and testified to what she had seen so she claims that on the 2nd of June in 1998 she noticed something strange that the lights in the house were completely off very early on in the evening earlier than normal and she found it really strange because the only lights that were on in the house were the lights in the bathroom and the lights in the laundry room and that the next evening the same thing happened but even earlier the lights went off very early and the only lights that were on in the house were the lights in the bathroom and the lights in the laundry room. So she found it really strange but she really didn't think too much about it. She just started to mind her own business and continued with her own life and didn't pay too much attention. So now when you look at it, her account corroborates that of the investigator the forensic investigator because when he did his own forensic investigation he found that there had been a lot of blood which had been in the bathroom and as well in the laundry room and in the laundry room the blood that was there was believed to be little little drops or little splatters of blood and this might have been because of something that was washed that had blood stains before and it was drying there because the blood was only found at the washing line so that's what the forensic investigator and the police believe is what happened so this just became worse and worse for thomas florin that all this now is pointing towards him and he was active in the house during that time and it just made him look worse and worse during that time then as the case went on on the 3rd of december thomas florin was found guilty of the murder of his wife and tampering with a dead corpse as well of hiding evidence and which is tampering of evidence sorry and he was then on the 22nd of December in 1999 he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison so he had to do a minimum of 15 years before he would ever be considered for parole 
which I find just so ridiculous. I mean, this guy cut up somebody, killed his wife, his wife, the mother of his children, and you can give him a minimum of 15 years? Like, I know people who have stolen cattle and they get 30 years in prison for that. You know, it's just, it's really crazy, the laws that are there. And while this was then happening, I don't know what then happened with his children because I cannot imagine how they can feel about this, like knowing that their father did this to their mother. But I believe they were placed under relative scare and that's who raised them, their relatives. So now they didn't have their mother and also they didn't have their father. And while Thomas was in prison, he was serving his life sentence, he only admitted to what he did in 2013 when he began applying for parole because now it had been 15 years and he was eligible for parole and that's when he admitted to everything he had did but then claimed that you know he didn't know what happened to him that night what came over him but he was extremely remorseful and understood the crime he had committed was a horrendous crime but that he had changed now that he was now a Christian man and had changed his ways and he was a model prisoner in the prison and he was good because he was jailed in the Ninduk Central prison and like I said now that he was eligible for parole he wanted to be released and made every attempt to be released but they were hesitating to release him because it was a horrendous crime it's not just something easy you forget or you forgive he tried together with other inmates, they formed some sort of union or a group where they were fighting their life sentences and wanted to be released on parole, especially since they felt they were changed people, that they should be forgiven and should be allowed a chance to come out as new people. And Thomas really wanted to leave prison because he claimed that his mother, who was in Germany, was terminally ill and he wanted the opportunity to say goodbye to her because he hadn't seen her in many years and just wanted to spend her dying moments with her. Which is so selfish. Do you realize how much he loves his mom? He wants to say bye to her, but literally deprived his children of their own mother. Like, it's just so narcissistic like how do you do that how do you make that make sense you know which is really unfortunate and that's how it has been in 2016 he tried to petition he tried suing the namibian high court tried suing the minister and like every other person he could sue within the legal system to sort of get his opportunity to be released but was unsuccessful and it is now being said that so now in 2024 is the next time when he could apply for parole again and I don't know if he has lost hope or he has hope but I believe he's still in prison because the only other newspaper I saw said in 2024 is when he could possibly be you know eligible for parole and might actually be released so yeah that is really it for this case quite unfortunate he literally cooked his wife who who does that like it's just really crazy and the kids like the judge said during the sentencing she has no idea how the children will ever feel about this if they can ever forgive their father for depriving them of their mother's love and how he can live with himself knowing that he did this to another human being someone who had spent so many years with and who he loved and loved him at some point and it's just quite unfortunate but then this is it for this case and I want to thank you all for listening again thank you for subscribing and loving everything i do i really appreciate the comments and the likes and you know everything else so thank you and goodbye and take care until the next video